So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, October the 4th of 2024. This is Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers, episode number 278. I'm Frederick Dunn, and this is The Way to Be. So I'm really glad that you're here with me today. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please go down in the video description and look at all the information there. There will be links and additional stuff that you might be interested in. And, uh, of course, topic by topic. It's all going to be in order there. So you might be wondering, before we get started, what's going on outside? Well, I'm glad you asked, because it's super nice out there. 72 degrees Fahrenheit and 1.5 mile an hour wind. So basically, no wind. And guess what? The bees can dry out their late season honey because it is only 57% relative humidity here in the northeastern United States, state of Pennsylvania, the Keystone State. So you might be wondering what's going on outside as far as the blooms go. Well, sad but true, goldenrod is gone. It's done. It's turned brown. It's not golden anymore, but we do have asters, so that's good news. The cosmos are still blooming, and of course, I plant those. The asters are just everywhere. They're fantastic. By the way, I think the app is called iNature, and you can take a picture of any wildflower that you find here in the United States, of course, and... Uh, Click on that and find out exactly what the species of plant is that you're looking at. It's fantastic because it's classified by the leaf or the fruit or the flower or the bark in case of many trees. And it's fantastic because there's so many asters out there I had no idea. New England asters are the coolest ones right now, in my opinion. Maximilian sunflowers are blooming fantastic. I have the tallest Maximilian sunflower stalks. I have ever had. And those are perennial. They come back every year on their own. The cosmos I have to plant. Um, Maximilian sunflowers are just visited by a lot of different pollinators. And uh, right now I have some that are 12, 13 feet. I, you know, I haven't measured them, but they're so high. I don't even know what to say about it. I wonder if that's the case for you too. There may be some you know, subtypes of the Maximilian sunflower, but uh, I planted a bunch of them. Well worth it. And uh, let's see, there's some white clover. It's not very good right now. Borage is still holding its own. Not a lot of blossoms, so not very many bees on it. Because if there's borage over here and there are asters over there by the thousands, you can't drive down a highway in the state of Pennsylvania right now, especially the state highway system, and look at all the asters in the ditches. There's a lot out there. So, um, what else? Let's see. Oh yeah, for those of you who are asking about the smoker fuel, the uh, switchgrass smoker pellets that we were selling through the nonprofit, uh, the Northwest Pennsylvania Beekeepers Association, I'm sorry to say that those are suspended until further notice. Why, Fred, did they work? Were they bad? What was wrong with them? No, the amount of work that it was taking to ship them out to people was just too much for the volunteers so now we're taking a break so i do appreciate those who supported that fundraiser to uh 
help with honeybee education and our outreach programs. So that's pretty much it. If you want to know how to submit your own topic for consideration, please go to my main website, which is thewaytobee.org. And there's a page marked The Way to Be. You click on that tab, there's a form, you fill it out, and you send it to me. Uh, some people, depending on the browser that you're on, um, have noted that it might look like an unsecure site. That is not a big deal. Um, it is a secure site. It has a certificate, it has a security certificate. But uh, that is only a big concern if you're actually shopping on a website. Like if you're downloading stuff or if you are using, you know, some kind of online wallet system or you're buying products direct, there's none of that going on on the website. So go ahead and click I feel safe and get right in there because it also might alert you because the title of the website might differ from the way to be.org because it's also fredsfinefowl.com because I'm also a poultry technician. So there you go. It's all in one website. Otherwise, I'd have to pay for all these things individually. So you can submit a topic that's interesting to you or a question that you might have. And maybe you've got a question that can't wait. You have to know right now. Join the fellowship. The Way to Be Fellowship on Facebook, 100% free. The only requirement is that it be about bees. You can't post any spam. And there are zero politics there. So that's refreshing. Go and join the Way to Be Fellowship. Fantastic. Great moderators. All right, I'm going to jump right into the very first question of the day, which comes from Brad. And Brad is a longtime viewer Longtime commenter and uh, also a photographer, by the way. So it says right here, Frederick, I have a super that is mostly uncapped and I want to dry and dehydrate. Do you have any ideas for me on how to do this without buying anything? Or if there's something you would recommend, please do. Grateful. Okay, so here's the thing. This is something that a lot of us are facing and depending on what part of the country you're in, it doesn't matter really. Um, here in the northeastern U.S., we get a lot of wet weather this time of year. And um, you have to pack down your hives as things get cold because we've got temps at night into the 30s right now. Brad is also in the northeastern United States, so he probably has similar weather. When you go to pull these things off, uh, you may find that half of the frame, half of the face of the comb is uncapped, even though you're pulling the honey. Is it good? So the first thing I would recommend because I'm going to tell you lots of things to do. It's a tough sell because Brad doesn't want me to mention anything that you would buy. So in other words, I don't know what's out in your tool shed or your garage or your kitchen or your basement or your attic. I don't know what things you have available. So there is a risk that I could recommend that you buy something. But before you do that, the number one thing that you should have, see I didn't say buy, a refractometer. If you don't know what a refractometer is, please Google it. Go to the YouTube. Go to my YouTube channel, which is Frederick Dunn, and in the top right, there's a line with a little search magnifying glass there. Type in refractometer, and I do comparisons of a bunch of different ones from the cheapest one to the most expensive one that I know about. That's used by state inspectors, food inspectors, and stuff like that. If you don't have a refractometer, you're kind of flying blind to begin with. There are some cheap ones, 29, 30 bucks, and uh, just go for the ones that have good reviews and learn to use them. And that's what, of course, the tutorial's for online. So first of all, test those open cells because I've been doing that. Now, I did come across some wet honey because I pulled off a whole super because I'm packing down for winter. And I'll explain a little bit about that later too. But it was wet honey. What is wet honey? How much moisture is too much moisture? Okay. If you're above 19% water in your honey, to me, that's too much. If you talk to state inspectors, what passes this honey for bottling and processing and stuff like that, under 20% is what one of them told me. So I'm voting for 18 something. So because if you go from 19 to 20, there's a risk of fermentation depending on how you store and care for your honey. Uh, the other thing is uh, above 20 year guarantee fermentation and it doesn't pass any inspection. So the other thing you have to consider is the tolerance of the equipment that you're using. So if you've got a refractometer that's inexpensive and maybe it has an accuracy of plus or minus 3% or something like that, then you need to fail safe. So you need to have a calibration standard for that refractometer. 
So you find somebody that has a more expensive system, a more accurate system, like the MISCO unit that tests and that's what inspectors use. Inspectors have to have the tightest tolerances when it comes to refractometers. Why? Because they may be rejecting a ton, a literal ton of honey. So they have to be right when they say it's too wet and so on. And there's a low limit too, by the way, which is really interesting to me. And I don't know right off the top of my head what it is, but if it's at 13% moisture, that honey becomes suspect according to the inspectors. So look up that parameter too. Honey can be too dry. So for me, the target zone 17 to 18% right around in there. Now the question here is how can I dehydrate it without spending any money? But you should know, I care about your back, about your posture, and I don't want a thick wallet to make you sit crooked and maybe hurt your lumbar region. So I recommend thinning the wallet by shopping for new stuff. And I hope you understand that I'm that that's a joke, that I'm being funny. Okay, let's think about how the bees dry out their honey. First of all, make sure it's honey, uh, because sometimes, depending on the time of year, although it's not a risk right now, but uh, if you did this at some times of the year, they're trying to control the humidity inside the hive. And some bees actually bring in water and they can actually put water in some cells. So in a dry area. So they also paint the surfaces, but make sure it's actually honey. So when the bees get the nectar from the flower, that is sucrose. So they collect the sucrose and guess what? There are enzymes in their honey stomach, which is also known as the honey crop because it really isn't an area where anything gets digested but this enzyme is called invertase. And what it does is even while the bee is bringing this home uh, to the hive, it is starting to invert the sugar, okay? So invertase creates invert sugar. And then that end up, ends up being glucose and fructose. And those percentages of glucose and fructose can change. And I'm not gonna get deep into that because I don't think that's why you're here. You just wanna dry it down. But what I'm suggesting is it's being processed into honey already by the bees on their way back. Now, when that bee hits the landing board, gets inside the hive, and like right now, it sounds like there are swarms in every tiny bee yard right now because we have temperatures in the 70s, a sunny day, and we have lots of nectar and lots of pollen out there for them to get. So they're zipping really fast. Bees are efficient. So when those foragers come in, with that nectar in their crop, they go immediately to another bee. Now they might do a waggle dance, but I think most of the bees in the hive right now, most of the foragers know where to go. So not every bee coming back will do a waggle dance, particularly if that same waggle dance at the same location is already going on. So they'll pass it off to what I call storekeeper bees. Those are bees who've never left the hive. So this is, they're healthy, they're clean, they haven't been out in the dirt. And uh, they take the nectar from the bee that flies in that foraged for it. So when they do that, guess what they're doing? There is some drying that's going on when they're passing from bee to bee. And also there's more of that enzyme being added to alter the sugars. And so they may pass that to a couple of different ones, but at least one other bee aside from the forager is going to transfer that resource and they will put it into a cell. Now, when they first put it into the cell, it occupies, depending on the source of it, we're assuming they're not robbers because if they're robber bees, that's honey that requires no further processing. That means they get in there, they stole the honey from some other bees, they flew back to the hive, they pass that on, it goes immediately into the cell, they fill cells with that, and they start capping it right away. So the 100% gain for the bees with the least amount of effort is to rob other bees, but that's not what we're gonna talk about. So let's say they got it from flowers. They didn't mug the neighborhood, you know, other bees that couldn't hold their own. And so um, then when that bee puts it in, the storekeeper bee, they spread it out. They create more surface area. So bees are telling us more surface area, the quicker it will dry down. Now, how do they dry it? Well, they don't pick up a dehumidifier, which I'm going to suggest that you get if you don't already have one. But uh, they fan it. So for us, let's think about that. Could we fan our honey? Sure could. So we turn on a fan. Uh, fans are cheap, by the way. So I'm sure Brad's already got one. I'm not telling him to go out and get one. Maybe borrow one from a neighbor. 
uh, oscillating fans unnecessary you want to aim it right at the surface of whatever your container of honey is you can even do this to the frames themselves because i've done that put them on a rack put the whole box into my dehydrator uh, which isn't free sorry and then you blow fans at it and you circulate the air and what else do the bees do uh, the colony is probably pretty warm in there so this combination of warmth and air movement accelerates the evaporation of the water from the honey so even though they spread it out over all of the cells on a frame i'm sure you've seen that before within a couple of days it's right down to about half that space and it's more dense so they've evaporated off the water and that's when they start topping off those cells and that's when they start capping them so we want to do that we want to dry it down before we extract it so air movement dry air so there is something i want to mention i use a indoor plant growing tent those things are very inexpensive it is never going to wear out vivarium vivo sun is the company that i use and uh, i'm sure it was sold in the past to people that were growing cannabis and stuff like that but i use it to dry out honey so i can even put jars of honey on a rack in this space and why do i put it inside a drape because the larger room that it's in uh, has a much higher humidity level so if i put these into a smaller drape like a vivo sun and it's not a big one uh, although i would recommend getting the biggest one that you can put in the space that uh, you hope to use it for and so i put fans in there they clip to the frame i put a dehumidifier in there and just the fan from the dehumidifier runs so it's not dehumidifying per se so how do i get the moisture out of the air i'm glad you asked i'm sorry if this will cost you money this stuff is called damp rid this is a big bucket of it it says uh high capacity this is uh, four pounds this is a four pound bucket now i have this in a lot of rooms in my house specifically storage rooms like your basement and stuff since i have these things in my basement i don't have any musty smell so the moisture is way down so this helps in a lot of different ways but now we're talking about drying out the honey so i have two of these sitting on the floor in my vivo sun they come just like this you pull off the top and you're in business how long does this last how much moisture does it collect well it doesn't really have to collect much moisture and i've had it in there i haven't replaced one of these buckets for two years and there is a gauge on the side there's the level right here is a little window on it that shows when the moisture gets up to here or whatever that uh, discard when absorbed moisture reaches this line it couldn't be simpler than that so damp rid four pound size because they don't play games got a whole bunch of them now i was talking to somebody else recently who said you know what they use to dry out their honey they put it in their bathroom so and they run the dehumidifier in there dehumidifiers use up a lot of energy by the way now think about your bathroom when somebody says they put it in their bathroom i also ask this questions when people put it in the basement where do they use usually the utility room is the laundry room also what else is in there well in my neck of the woods there's a sump pump in there so the sump pump often has a basket that goes under grade and there's about six inches of water standing in it is that a problem if you're trying to dehumidify your honey over here in the corner sure because that's also contributing moisture to the air and challenging your dehumidification system bathroom what's in there your toilet you just close a toilet lid that doesn't do it because there's little vent spaces around the rim of the toilet lid so you're going to have to saran wrap that thing also you're going to close all your drains why because there's a pee trap under your sink there's a pee trap under your shower and there's another pee trap under your tub which might also be your shower but that p trap it's called the p trap because it's shaped like a p anyway you cover it so that there's no water surface exposed there because if we're trying to dry things down close off all the things under your control and make the space as dry as possible now 
Turn on your fans, have the heat. So at a bare minimum, we need three things. Refractometer, because we have to know, otherwise how do we know if it's doing any good? You need a fan, you need air movement, stagnant air. We all know what that's like. You go out in stagnant air on a hot summer night after a rain and it gets really hot, there's no relief from the rain because there's no air movement that can help you evaporate the perspiration from your skin, for example. So we need air movement to get the moisture out of the honey. So uh, you need a fan, you need a refractometer, and uh, I think that's the bare minimum and a way to increase the heat unless you want it to be there for a long time. Um, so that's why the big time beekeepers have hot rooms where they stage all their stuff. All the pallets come in with everything and it's warmed up into the 90 degree area, 98, 99 degrees Fahrenheit. And they move the air around and they have several industrial sized dehumidifiers going on in there. We don't need that. And besides that, it would cost Brad a lot of money to set that up. So let's talk about what these things cost just for kicks. If you went to Home Depot, Menards, Lowe's, whatever your home center is, the two pounds, so the half size ones of that, because you don't need a four pounder, they're $12.97 a piece. If you buy them online and they ship them to you. So uh, the other thing is uh, the space heater. Let's say, let's say you're trying to do this in your basement. You're gonna wanna warm things up. Look, I just happen to have a space heater here. These things are cheap. Now this one happens to be set at exactly 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So these work for controlling the temperature and look, it even has a little plunger on the bottom. So if it fell over, it would shut itself off. But where I'm setting it up, there's no movement. So as a backup plan, let's say I had to dry down some honey midwinter. It never happens, but it could. Better to have it and not need it, as they say. So I set this inside my Vivo Sun growing tent designed for cannabis used for honey. So this oscillates if you needed to, I don't need it to do that. So this moves air around in that closed environment. It also provides the heat necessary to accelerate that process. So now we have, if you're willing to spend some money, so maybe you're, you're not like Brad, you're willing to spend money on things that you don't have to buy a lot of, by the way. Just think of all the money you're gonna get for the honey, which rhymes with money, and that's not funny. It's a great way for you to make a living, a sideline living off of your honeybees. Okay, so I think that's it for Brad. Without buying anything, mm, you better have stuff around or friends you could borrow from. But that's it, I think I covered it. That's how we dry it down. And then once it's dry, get that stuff Run it through a 200 micron filter while it's hot. By the way, it's another advantage to warming it up because that 200 micron filter, it's hard to get your honey through it if it's only gonna be 70 or 80 degrees Fahrenheit. You want that up into the 90s. 105 would be perfect because your honey processing time then is really fast. Moving on to question number two. This comes from Captain Brian's Bees. Had a late season swarm. I was able to catch and retain the queen. Will she be able to lay enough winter brood and will the hive she swarmed from be able to get their new queen mated and laying? This is a question I'm getting a lot this time of year. So would I, now in the past, let's, let's cover all angles here to some degree. In the past, like let's say I walk outside right now, you know, we're in October. Let's say I see a swarm, you know, that my bees demonstrate poor judgment. They swarm out, they're on a tree branch. What am I gonna do with them now? Well, what I do with them now would be different than what I did with them, would have done with them years ago. So years ago, I just like to see if they can make it. So I get underdog swarms like that. I have them up, see what happens and uh, celebrate myself, my own achievement, if the bees somehow make it through winter. This year, I don't do that anymore. Why? Because I'm at capacity. I don't want any more bees, right? So this presents us with a pickle, right? Because part of this is um, too late to get the new queen mated and laying before winter. I would say it is. If nothing else, huge demand on them because of what's happening right now. Test me out on this. Go out at sunrise, look at your landing boards and see how many drones are being tossed out. A lot of them. 
they're kicking the drones out right and left. So it's not good drone time. So it's not a good time for them to fly. The drone congregation areas probably don't have very many uh, males hanging out. So the queen may have to make multiple flights. Here's the other problem, okay? The environment now is different than it was in spring. And by that, I mean, there are more predators out there that have maximized their capability to hunt queens on the wing. So speaking specifically about the Northeastern United States, there are more dragonflies on the wing right now than there would be in June. Right now, in June, there would be queen wasps. The Vespidae would all be out there hunting things, but there aren't very many of them because they're all just getting started out. So what's going on here now? All of these wasp nests are maxed out. They have their biggest populations, their biggest numbers. They have the most hunters on the wing of any other time of year. So it is more treacherous for your queen to get out there, get mated, and make it back without being nabbed right out of the air by one of these masters of the sky known as a dragonfly. They're big, they're capable, and you know what? They have a 100% success rate once they target something, which I find very interesting. So this is not the time of year to count on them to do it. But let's say you wanted to let them do their thing. I'm going to recommend a nucleus hold for the queen. So if we've got the queen, you collected the swarm, put the swarm in a tiny nucleus hive, two or three frames. And this is your insurance policy. This is just what I would do. So, I mean, there may be other people that'll say to do different things and many different things could still work. I'm going to suggest that you do this as an insurance policy. So you take your queen isolation cage. I'm gonna explain why this is a win-win. You take this queen isolation cage and uh, this is with your swarm that you just hived. And look, there's frames in here. These happen to be better comb, better frames. Okay, better be frames by better comb. Okay, also known as hexacell if you're in Hungary. Now we put her in here, look at this, this is a double one. And what's going to happen is, let's say the queen is super productive, but we don't care about production in this. We just want to retain the queen for a while, right? So, keep her long enough to get the new queen mated. So, how much time do we need to figure that out? So, we'll put the queen in here, and uh, we'll put a single frame of brood. So, pull one of these combs that's full and put in a single frame of brood. Now, when I put this in the hive that we took them out to take care of the swarm, no, I would put empty placeholders in there, not frames that the bees would start to work. So what kind of placeholder am I talking about? I'm talking about frame feeders, which I don't use to feed the bees inside the hive. I put frame feeders in the hive that I'm taking these frames out of as a placeholder because I'll have two frames in here, therefore I need two spaces in the hive because when that colony fails to replace their queen and the queen fails to get mated and she doesn't come back and start producing eggs in two to three weeks because now we're in the last couple of weeks of October. Uh, if she's not doing that, they're in trouble or are they? They're not in trouble. Why? Because Captain Brian saved the queen and the queen was productive in this queen isolation cage and she's been laying eggs in here and she's got brood with her that take care, they're taking care of the brood. She's got enough bees to do that work. And then, because it's a swarm, right? They're ready to do stuff. And then, after that failure, we come back like heroes. Now, the reason they're all here and kept on this is because we don't want brood spread out through multiple frames. We only want two because we're only gonna be able to put two back in the original hive after their failure, and we get to come back and save the colony. In the meantime, there's no lost time because the queen has continued to produce her eggs, the old queen did, and they fed them and their larvae and everything else now. And on the eighth day, they're gonna be capped. So now they're in the pupa state. So they're low maintenance by that point. They only need to be kept warm. And so that second week to the third week, when we're sure that there's no new queen in there and they're desperate for a new queen, we don't just bring back the queen, we bring back brood and they're in full production and they're fine. 
you're going to survive. I think that's a much better way to go. What are your thoughts about that? Now let's say you're like, let's say you're like Brad. You don't want to buy anything. You're done buying stuff. You don't want to buy a queen isolation cage and you don't have one. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering, those come from Better Bee, so you can go get one. I highly recommend you have these on the shelf ready to go. There's so many uses for them. Okay, so we don't want to do all that. Next recommendation, send all those bees back where you got them from. So we get them on frames in the new, in where you've hived your swarm. Find the queen, remove the queen. So their swarm mode, here's the thing. You remove their queen, her pheromone's gone. We cannot have eggs in there. So we don't want her in production. This has to happen fast. Because if she lays eggs, even though it's a swarm, and then you kill the queen, what are they going to do? They're going to try to replace their queen. So they're going to start to make queen cells. This is an impossible thing at this time of year. So, well, okay, not impossible, highly improbable. So you take the queen away and you move them right back into the original colony. Strong queen pheromone. They won't be building queen cells and all that and uh, they're all good to go. So you bring them back together if by some miracle they made it their new queen and everything is good there. We get rid of the old queen and put them back because now we can see that she's laying and stuff. What do you think about that? I think there's, I think those are great options. So, and you have this option straight away, which by the way, I will talk about this because I played around with some late season swarms already last month. So the month of September, I took a seven gallon bucket, which I highly recommend. Those things are really tall. Standard five gallon white plastic food grade bucket is what some people use. I like the sevens. And uh, I took a queen excluder. Oh look, I just happen to have one here. I like the queen excluders to have wooden frames on them like this one. I took the bucket. I shook all the bees off the tree branch that they were on into the bucket slick sided bucket, put this on as the lid, sat it down in the bee yard, right? I want to make sure the queen's in there. So what do they do? Well, they did their scouting. They checked everything out and they tried to go and move to a new location, but their queen couldn't go with them. Now that means I have this queen under my control and I can get rid of her. They're still in swarm mode if I wanted to get rid of the queen. And by that, I mean, kill her make a queen lure if you want to. Some people do that by putting her body in isopropanol. I guess it makes them feel good that the queen wasn't wasted. But if you kill the queen and they come back and they can't get her to go anywhere because now she's gone, thanks to you, the jerk who took away the queen. Maybe if you've got a friend who's queenless, you could give her to them. And then what happens to the swarm population? They end up going back to the original colony and guess what else they do? They disperse amongst the other colonies in your apiary. It's pretty interesting. They drift all over the place. So they don't all just go back. Early on, when I started keeping bees and I used to play with swarms all the time, I was obsessed with it. Catch the queen, see what they do. Put the queen over here, see if they follow her, all this stuff. And you begin to learn that those foragers are up for any new home. Not just that, what makes them a welcome addition to any colony of bees that you have? The fact that they're fully loaded, they're full of resources. They loaded up before they swarmed. They're capable of making new beeswax features inside a hive. So this time of year, that's rare. They would be in demand. So they will not have troubles finding a home. So that saved you from having to start a handicapped colony, a colony that's going to need help all the time until they get up to full strength. So you can remove the queen. Queen excluder on top of the bucket that I shook the swarm in that helps me find the queen, if nothing else. So when they swarm away, because guess what? I'll stick with this for a minute. Uh, when they think they found a new area to go to, which is going to be better than the bucket that you provided them so generously, the seven gallon white food grade bucket. When they all fly away to this new location, the only one left in here is going to be the queen and a handful of other bees that didn't depart with the rest of them. It makes it so easy for you to find it. And that was my goal, was to find a way to isolate the queen to make sure I had her. 
And uh, doing that, queen excluder on a bucket. Works great. All right, question number three. And if you have more questions, if I didn't explain something very well, please write in the comment section. I'm glad to add information that will help clear up the fuzzy picture that I've created for you. Michael here says, uh, honey leaves stains in porous stone. Maybe you've noticed that honey leaves a dark stain in porous stone. I've tried pressure washing and that removes some of the dark stain. I'm guessing it's the hydrophilic nature. Do you have any ideas or other ideas to remove these stains? So here's the thing. I don't have an answer for Michael. So why is it part of my Q&A today? Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to crowdsource this. You are now being tasked because I want to know. We have all these viewers. We have all of these people that pay attention, that check in and like to know things, like to learn things, but also like to share what they know. So I'm inviting you to share what you know about getting stains from honey out of porous stone. What's your method? What do you do? How does it work? Does somebody have a YouTube video on that? I couldn't find one. So if you have a way of doing that, cleaning that up, one of the things I think about, this has nothing to do with bees, but it has to do with stained stone. Uh, when I was photographing bats in bat caves and uh, places where, and barns where the bats would be in the summertime with all their offspring. So each bat has a single baby bat, right? And uh, they heavily stain the surface that they're clinging to, not to mention the guano that falls straight down below them. But I see lots of stained stone up there. And that's what I visualized is that stained stone that you would find in caves and stuff uh, when honey also stains porous stone. How would you get it out? How would you get it out? Share your thoughts. Let's help Michael out and the rest of us who may have that question or concern. I know how to get beeswax out of things just through heat and then use an absorbent material to draw it out. But the honey itself staining things, I don't know. I don't, couldn't find an answer, don't have an answer, and I don't have any to test it on. I guess I would have to actively stain something and then try to reverse what I did. But uh, that's it. How do you get honey out of honey stains out of porous stone? Moving on to question number four, it comes from David. Uh, the case of the vanished bees. Hi, Fred. My stepfather lives in Carmel Heights, just south of Monterey, California. Monterey Bay. Fantastic area. I've been up there. I love that part of the country. Anyway, California in May this year was lucky enough to have a large swarm bivouac on a dwarf magnolia tree in easy reach. As it happens, I had gifted him a six frame lands swarm trap in which he had a local beekeeper transfer the swarm. There's an old local feral hive in a hollow eucalyptus tree just down the road from the house. And I assume that was the source of the bees. The bees were extremely gentle and appeared to be doing very well. One thing notable, was they were very late risers, probably due to the temperatures there being always on the cool side. They rarely ventured out before 11 a.m. in late July, and I watched numerous bees bring in pollen and observed several drones outside the hive. Ooh, that's key. Several drones outside the hive. This ties into what I think happened. By September, something went terribly wrong and the bees appear to have absconded. When I examined the hive, there were no bees living or dead in or around the hive. The hive was spotlessly clean, except for some torn caps, which were clear signs of robbing, whatever honey had been left behind. Anyway, since there were no dead bees, it seemed to me that the robbing occurred after they left. The frames were all fully built out, which is significant since, this is another part, only half started with foundation, as can be seen in the photos. So a bunch of photos were sent with this. Anyway, all looked like they were used for brood with minimal honey stores near the tops of the frames. It looks like there may be some queen cells, but I'm not an expert enough to know if they were used. Question is, did the bees abscond? And if so, why? 
did the bees abscond? Okay, so I actually like this kind of stuff. Why did the bees abscond? And we need a thorough history. We need good records on what's been going on with this colony. But listen to these descriptions, bad beekeeper overall. Sorry to be the one to point that out. Because here's the thing, we noticed earlier on, right? These have been there since May of this year. So full summer. There were some issues though. Look, only drones outside the hive. What's that tell you? Which bee inside a hive will produce drones? Laying workers. Why would there be laying workers? No queen or a queen that's not productive, right? So by September, something went terribly wrong. Okay, so July, we saw nothing but drones. And in September, something went terribly wrong. So we had the entire month of August to take a look. This is why I recommend if you're a backyard beekeeper, first of all, get out in your bee yard as often as you can. It doesn't bother your bees one bit for you to take your coffee or whatever you like drinking, sit out there and stare at the landing boards and see what the activity is like. See who's coming and going, see what they're doing. And then you'll start to notice, wow, there's nothing but drones in this one, what's going on? It wouldn't have hurt to open the hive then and look inside and find out that we had a queenless situation. Now, the abscond claim, right? Listen to this, though. Did they abscond or did they dwindle down to nothing? Because then the colony was raw. But here's the thing. When a colony is robbed, there's usually a lot of waste material spread on the landing board on the bottom of the hive. So I don't see that addressed here, but it says that all the frames were clean. Does that also mean the bottom board was clean? And was it a solid bottom board? If it is, now it's not just a matter of being robbed out. They could have consumed their own resources because as they dwindle, what do they lose? When they start dwindling, which means that the older bees are just dying out. So once they're foraging, they're only good for a couple of weeks and then they're burnt out and they're done. So then we have to, as we lose numbers, they start to forage earlier. In other words, they don't wait until going into their fifth week of life to start to forage outside the hive. They might be doing that at the third week or the fourth week early in the fourth week, right? And so they might be prematurely wearing themselves out because they don't have replacement brood coming up of workers. Instead, they're just making drones. Drones will be consumers. They'll put a demand and a strain on them. And uh, I think that part of the country doesn't get much colder than 60 degrees. I believe when I was there, it was between 60 and 80 year round. Like it never got colder than 60, never hotter than 80. It was, that's why all those retired admirals live up there. It's, it's a perfect area. So anyway, uh, they could have dwindled and just used up all the resources inside the hive as they tried to hold their own until they spent their lives out but you would tend to see some capped drones at the end because eventually they, just, they don't have enough bees to keep them warm while they emerge, right? So now, but let's look at some other things. Let's say uh, the conditions were different. Uh, a clean abscond, uh, all the bees would have to decide to go without uh, splitting, without creating a swarm and without doing what they are genetically designed to do, which is cast a swarm keep a colony present that they cast from, right? So if they're all just going to leave, we have to consider now, what are the conditions inside the hive, right? So one of the things is they can just flat outgrow the space, but it doesn't sound like it because this is a lands hive and there were six frames. Yeah, six frame lands swarm trap. So it is a swarm trap, but the lands frames are pretty darn big. So they could have outgrown it, but generally when they outgrow a space like that, let's make a comparison to nucleus hives that we use as resources. When their populations build and they're jammed in there shoulder to shoulder, what they do is they swarm. They don't just leave altogether. So I'm going to say it's not the size of the hive that caused them to leave. So let's move on. We'll check that off. Uh, the next one, and this is speculatory, look in those cells because it says the cells are super clean, but I don't know if David knows to look for frass. What is that? Frass. We have to look for the droppings, the remains of Varroa destructor mites having been there because when the bees are leaving the hive, those mites will be on the bodies of the bees, the last ones to leave. That's why this time of year, when we get 
smaller colonies, we get attrition, right? That they're not replacing them at the rate that they're dying off. So as they get smaller and smaller and smaller, what happens? If you've got a colony that's got a lot of row destructor mites in it, they don't have as many hosts that spread out over. So what happens is, what do we just lose? A whole bunch of drones. So now the mites have to all go on to worker bees. And which worker bees do they prefer? They prefer the nurse bees. So now they concentrate even more on that. This is why at the end of the year, for those of you who do mite washes and mite counts, and I hope you do, uh, you suddenly see, whoa, a whole bunch of mites now. And then people will speculate, well, they must have robbed out a dying colony that was diseased and they got all their mites and brought them back, blah, blah, blah. Um, or your colony is condensing, the brood area is getting smaller, right? Fewer places for the reproductive mites to reproduce in, and therefore now they're all out. They're phoretic, which is now the dispersal phase. And they'll attach themselves to the bodies of the remaining bees, fewer bees, same number of mites. It seems like the mite load increases when actually it stays the same. It's the hosts that are running out, right? They're running out of those. So a high concentration of varroa striker mites annoying, feeding upon, and harassing the bees. You know, we all, I've never seen this in real life. In other words, I've never picked up a honeybee and seen her just being jumped by drone, by uh, varroa striker mites. Um, you see these pictures, you know, there'll be a picture of a bee and the mites are on the thorax and they're on the side and they're on the abdomen and they're on the underside of the abdomen. There's another one up on the head and there's one dangling from the foot. Um, I've never seen that. I have to wonder if that picture is not for dramatic effect or that's the last honeybee standing and therefore the last resource in the hive for these mites to dogpile onto. But if you have a varroa destructor mite problem and you are not, one, counting them so that you know you have a problem, and then two, being prepared to deal with the mites that you have, uh, you're leaving your bees to be fed upon to their death. Or bees don't put up with it, psh, they scoot off and they're gone. They took the mites with them though, so their problems are not solved. The other thing is, uh, I wonder if there's old comb. So here's another thing. Another reason that your bees might leave a hive is because there's residue in the comb as it builds up and it can become toxic. The bees will even start to avoid, there was no mention here of pollen that's stored. So, and I don't know what goes on up in Monterey, I don't know agriculturally what's out there. Um, but if they had pollen that also had high pesticide loads that the bees could detect and they wouldn't use the pollen and the pollen's being saved there, this stuff also works its way into comb construction. And so now we get concentrations of industrial agricultural chemicals. Pesticides, by the way, includes herbicides, insecticides, and all the other things. So it's not just insecticides. Pesticides are anything that's put out there chemically that's designed to kill something, right? That we consider a pest. So... If the comb, or if there's pollen in there that's toxic, your bees could leave it. Now that's a stretch. Maybe you don't want to spend the money to have your comb tested and see what kind of pesticide load there is. And it doesn't identify a target, right? So uh, what could you do to find out if you are living in an area that has high agricultural pesticide loading? Every farmer every agricultural practice has to register and log in that they are using pesticides, what they are, what the dose is, what the rate of spread, blah, blah, blah. Where can you find out? You put in your zip code to a website called bscape.org, B-E-E-S-C-A-P-E dot org. You put that in and one of the options that you have there is to click on and see if the area where you live has a high pesticide load. Where I happen to live, extremely low. It's like a 35 or a 40, which is really low. That's great. Now we go to my son and daughter-in-law's house. They're only, you know, 15 minute drive to the north of us. They live in wine country. So all the vineyards are all around them. His pesticide load is over 250. Think about it. There's so much pesticide up there. 
And we have troubles keeping bees alive in his yard there. It's very interesting. So you can go to Beescape and find out if that's what you're facing too. So what we're doing is we're collecting all the pieces of the potential puzzle to try to bring into focus why those bees left. Uh, the bottom line is they're gone. So what we want to make sure is that we're not going to try to reoccupy the same hive box if there's any chance that something in that box prevents your bees from wanting to go in it. So have you ever tried to install a swarm and they just wouldn't go in this hive? And the hive, as far as we're concerned, looking at it, it's a healthy hive. It's clean. It's perfect for bees. Look, I even put sugar syrup in there. Why wouldn't they go in there? So they smell things we don't smell. They sense things we don't sense. Now, we know the varroa mites are gone, but is the frass gone? Is there a bunch of varroa mite waste material in there? Is there varroa doo-doo inside the cells? So you need to break out the low-pressure air and blow out all the cells and clean them out, which, by the way, is now my favorite method of cleaning up a frame of a brood frame that still has some capped drones and things like that in it low pressure air with a very focused little pointed nozzle i did a uh, quick tip on that and it worked so well it blows the bees right out of it because even though there was a tiny cluster of dead bees that were stuck in there because what did they do they lost their queen after they lost their queen they dwindled while they're dwindling they're making drones now we have drones that are partially emerged from those frames and all the bees are gone so now this low pressure air blows the cappings off the brood and just that little remaining bit and the drones blew out. And as soon as I did that, I got the uh, colony occupied by other bees right away. So we think we can use the bees as a cleanup crew. Sometimes we can, but we have to remove residue of things that your bees don't want to deal with. So let me see what else. And remember that was a swarm trap. They should have been moved into a larger hive by then. So that's the other thing. And the reminder I want for everyone listening is you need to inspect, by the way, if you're in the Northeast United States or here in the state of Pennsylvania, tomorrow is a great inspection day. It's going to be warm, no threat of rain, cloudless sky, low winds, perfect day to do that final checkup and maybe condense your hives a little bit. But you should be looking into potential problemed hives every two to three weeks because past that three weeks, if you've lost your queen, that's when your layers are going to be active and they're starting, your workers are going to be active and they will start laying drone eggs. So I hope one of those ideas holds true and uh, maybe we even get a follow-up from David who lives in paradise, by the way. That is a great part of the country. Kelp forests, very creepy to dive in, by the way. Okay, question number five. This comes from, do, 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 do. It just says, hi, Fred. I can no longer find, find the form on your website for a question. I hope email is okay. Okay, oh, I am Leanne in Oregon, first year beekeeper. I learned from you to look at the landing boards early in the morning. Wow, such good advice, is what she said. I didn't just say that. She wrote it. Okay. Yesterday, September 29th, before tending the chickens, I had a look and was absolutely stunned to see the queen had wandered out and was sitting out still in the 40 degree morning. She died not too long afterward and the bees just pushed her off the landing board like any other dead worker. So sad. She was a young queen just this past July. She brought this very weak hive back from near extinction due to a swarm. She was strong and performed well. There is still open larvae. So this happened fast. I'm a retired engineer and made a flow chart as to what may have happened. Okay. In order to shorten the email, I would just say I'm pretty sure I eliminated all the root causes except for two and my questions are related. Okay. So here's question number one. What on earth should I do with the queen to keep her alive outside the hive during the 10 days of treatment? And she asked this question because one of the things that she did that she thinks may have caused the death of the queen, I treated with Formic Pro three weeks ago and the directions state that the queen can die up to four weeks afterwards. This is true. 
So, what should I do to the queen to keep her alive outside of a hive during 10 days of treatment? So, if you're going to treat with Formic Pro, a lot of people do this when they're swapping out their queens and everything else anyway. So, I'm going to recommend the same thing I recommended earlier. Remember, take the queen out, put her in this uh, queen isolation cage, set her in a nucleus resource hive, use placeholders that replace the number of frames that you pull out with the queen on it during treatment. Now, if we're going to do this during treatment, right, we don't want to take any Varroa destructor mites with our queen. So we don't want them to be in the, the state where they're reproducing underneath pupa. So we'll pull a frame of honey, let's say, half open, half covered, blah, blah. Put that in there and put our queen in there because as the honey gets consumed by the nurse bees that we're going to send with her, some of those may have a couple of Varroa destructor mites on them. So you can inspect them for that. You can knock them out with CO2. You can do what uh, Dr. Thomas Seeley does, which is he puts them in the refrigerator for 10 minutes, brings them out, and then you can inspect them for varroa mites without any harm to them. Then they warm up and they're back in business. Because we're just taking care of the queen and we're not taking care of a bunch of brood during this period, right? Um, we put the queen in there, we put a bunch of nurse bees with her, and they just attend to the queen. So you will be out of the dark. And the reason I say this is because Formic Pro is the most disastrous to queens in the first three to four days of the treatment cycle, right? It's the most volatile. The fumes are the strongest. Everything is going on then. So as it tapers down, then now we have a weaker exposure. So that's when you could actually bring them back to your beehive, right? Transfer them back. Pull her out, pull your space holders out put the frames back in with the queen on it, you're back in business. So another part here says, could I have damaged her during a recent inspection? She looked perfect with absolutely no signs of physical damage. She wasn't curled up, no varroa or viral vectors. Okay, we can't see if a queen has a virus, so we can eliminate that. Varroa destructor mites don't attach themselves to queens. Queens are just groom too frequently, their abdomens are extended and they have very tight plates, right? So that the Varroa destructor mite has a far more difficult time trying to get up under there. If we look at the abdomen of a queen, is it nice and fuzzy? No, it's very smooth. So they're not a target for Varroa destructor mites. So I've never seen a mite on a queen. So we can eliminate that too. Um, I have seen workers kill queens when new queens were coming. So if we're 100% sure that there's no replacement queens coming in, because that's the other thing that could actually be happening, it just happens to happen at a time when you just recently treated with Formic Pro. Formic Pro, for those of you who are wondering, it's an organic treatment um, and it is uh, very effective. So that's all I'll say about that. Uh, the other thing is, so we need to follow up and just make sure they weren't replacing the queen because when they do that, they stop feeding the one that they're going to send out. My wife and I have observed uh, bees in the observation hives attacking queens and killing them. So they didn't even leave it up to the queen to do it. Uh, they were selectively killing the queens I personally liked, by the way. And uh, then she would eventually just be dead on the landing board and then they would drag her out. So, and you know, on the bottom of the observation hive. So there are a lot of things that could be going on, but I would also keep an eye on whether or not they have a replacement queen in, you know, in the works there. So, small brood on the frame, blah, 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 insert placeholders, and uh, you have an option to get those mites off of any bees that you take with her, restore the queen afterwards. So in other words, if you did this, obviously this is after the fact, but the next time you did it, if you remove the queen, with a small cluster of workers just so they can maintain her. It's kind of like um, just storing your queen. Some people put them, think of a queen finishing cage or a nuke or something like that, where they have just enough workers to attend to the queen. You can do that, it keeps her alive. It's called banking queens. Some people do it after they've made it before they sell them. So you're effectively kind of banking a queen if you wanna set her off to the side to bring her back later after the treatment. Um, and, uh, of course that cage is required if you want to do the nucleus resource hive method that I described earlier on. Question number six. Oh, this is one that 
was just interesting. It's not a big deal. But somebody said, what is that sound? Because I don't see their wings flapping. And that's because uh, some of the videos that I have on my YouTube channel just deal with the noises that honeybees make. Because it's really interesting to me. I like to uh, video and record and get really in-depth audio recordings, full wave audio of the bee noises inside a hive. And it sounds, there's a hum, a steady hum. But that's because we have thousands of bees inside. But it is true that they make this humming sound without fanning their wings. Now, sometimes they are fanning the wings. Sometimes they're not. So this is a very beginner style question. So if the bees were not fanning their wings, but they were vibrating, they would just vibrate the muscles that otherwise would flap their wings. They just disconnect that part and they're not flapping the wings. They're vibrating the muscles, which generates warmth inside the hive. And sometimes that can actually be really loud. Um, I have a video that I'm going to show at the North American Honeybee Expo, which has bees warming up their little motors and they are not flapping their wings, but it's very distinct and very loud. It goes ee, 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 ah, ee. They're all making this buzzing sound without flapping their wings because they're warming up to deal with a predator. What's the predator, you might ask? Well, that's a cliffhanger. I'm not going to tell you because it's for my in-person presentation. But you can hear these noises because they are up against something. Um, so the bees have to be against something. The comb, the glass in an observation hive, other bees, they vibrate themselves against objects. Bees don't hear in the way that we hear. So airborne sounds don't mean anything to the honeybees. And uh, I've brought this up with experts in honeybee noise making, right? Airborne sounds, because there's a lot of kind of information out there that people think is possible, but with the bees' inability to hear, they don't communicate sending noises to one another. There is something called a near field effect that they have with their antennae. And even when bees are waggle dancing, their antennae are very close. And sometimes bees will make these little buzzes and vibrations while waggle dancing. And that can be picked up airborne between the bee and the antennae of another bee that's attending to the waggle dance. But we are talking about thousands of an inch close to make that work. So bees that want to communicate through vibration, they do it through the comb. And this also leads us to, when you look at the bottom of honeycomb inside hives, bees don't like to connect every edge to the frames that are there. If you're using frames like the Langstroth frames, they leave a you know two or three inch area that, that comes away from the sides of the interior of the frame. And they also don't connect all the way to the bottom of the frame. And this is in the bottom of the hive. Now the upper frames they do, they connect it all together. They even fill in the spaces between the frames and upper boxes. It's down at the bottom. So the other thing is where's the waggle dance happening and where are these noises happening, which just happens to be also where I put my transducers and acoustic pickup equipment near the dance floor, because that's where these interesting noises are. It even picks up their footsteps on the comb. So that comb, which is normally brood, right? Brood comb, it's tougher, it's fibrous as years go by. I try not to keep that stuff past five years because of what I mentioned earlier on, it actually becomes dense with chemicals that they're exposed to while they're foraging. But this free area that has a big empty area becomes the dance floor for waggle dances and it's a communication center for bees inside the hive, figuring out what's going on outside the hive. When the workers come in, they get on the dance floor, they waggle. It's where they can smell what the bees are bringing in. They can taste what the bees are bringing in. And they can, of course, observe the waggle dance and learn where that resource is located. And this part of the frame, this part of the comb down there, because it's not attached, has maximum vibration potential. So there's a resonance. There's something in ultrasound we call a fundamental resonance, which means it has to do, it absolutely matches the vibration that's being made with the thickness of the material that the bee is on. So if they do a vibration that is any matching of the thickness of the material that they're on, then that thick material 
that matching thickness material will vibrate or resonate just like a bell when you're in a bing. So if you can match the cadence of that, you'll magnify that sound capability on that material that they're on. I'm sure that was clean as mud. But the sounds that we hear, our vibrations are making against one another, against materials, and uh, that's why we hear it. Bees aren't generating a sound so much as they're generating a vibration that we hear as a sound because we have that ability to pick it up. So it's really interesting, and that was on the video Sounds from Inside the Hive, if you want to check it out. And all it is is a camera setup showing part of the brood frame of a beehive and just the recordings of the noises that they're making inside that hive. Question number seven comes from Jerry. And it says, I watched one of your videos where you add spirulina to your sugar water. And I've looked for it again, could not find it. Could you tell me how much to use per 10 pounds of sugar, mixing it two to one? Thank you. Okay. I did spirulina testing. And uh, because the studies, there's a new compilation study out. So I was looking for cheap ways to feed spirulina to the bees. And this is fun for me because I got these one gallon SC Johnson Ziploc bags. Now these are the heavy duty ones. So I wanted to put them to the test. This is for open feeding because I would not put something inside a beehive on top of the frames or up inside the feeder shim before I first find out what the leaking potential is. And I will answer the question about the percentage. In fact, I'm going to reshare the link that I shared last week down in the video description to the study about spirulina, because let's be honest, there's too much in it to simplify it to just, hey, how much spirulina should I be putting in dry sugar to mix with the water to make the syrup that best benefits the bees? I will let you read that yourself because what I'm doing might not actually be enough, but I'll give you my formula. So what I'm doing is I'm mixing one to one sugar syrup. So it's not even the heavy two to one syrup. Uh, and that's because I wanted to put it out to see if these bags leak. And these have holes in them, which I'm sure aren't showing. But if you look at the Ziploc part, it has little holes in it. And what it is, I took dissection needles which people that study biology and, and do dissection have. But you could use any pin. It could be a safety pin or something like that. And I poked holes in here and I did three different things to test whether or not. So I only poked holes on one side. One of these bags, the capacity is a gallon. So I filled it 100% until when I zipped it shut, there was no air left. And then I put that pillow of uh, syrup out for the bees. And I learned some things, which was fun. Uh, one is if you fill it the full gallon and you lay it on its side and you have your series of holes up here, uh, it does ooze out and starts dripping before any bees come to it. So if you fill them hundred percent, there will be some leaking. Now, can your colony of bees keep up with that? My frame of thinking is, uh, I don't want them to have to deal with syrup that they're not putting a demand for on my feeding system. So now this is open feeding outside. When I mix that spirulina with it, I use three heaping tablespoons of dry spirulina. And I'll put the link to the one I use. It's just the top rated organic spirulina. It's designed for people. And I get mine off of Amazon. You can do your own research, find your own source for spirulina. It has a consistency of talcum powder. That stuff goes airborne easy. So I take the dry four pounds of sugar. I put three heaping tablespoons of spirulina in it. When you mix this up and add the water, um, it looks black. That's how dark it is. It's really a deep viridian green. Anyway, you fill it to a gallon. It oozes. The bees do feed on it. I have time lapse videos, which are kind of fun to watch. I haven't decided if I'm going to put those up. Anyway, the next bag. So I did three different features, thin and thick, and then of course, half full. So if I took half a gallon and put it in a one gallon bag and poke the holes only in one side, of course, and I don't put the holes down in the corners and stuff, I keep them up near the upper center area of the cushion. 
And uh, so this bag half full, no leaks. The other thing is, what's the temperature of your sugar syrup that you're putting out? Uh, if you put this out on a hot day and it sits in direct sunlight, which is I had in direct sunlight, but I'm in the northeastern United States, and it wasn't that hot that day. It was in the 60s. So over a period of three days, we tested all of these. So I learned some things. Um, if you put really warm liquid in, it starts to ooze. If you put it at room temperature, so 70 degrees roughly, half a gallon, one-to-one -one sugar syrup, with, with or without spirulina made no difference, just sugar syrup, um, it did not leak. So that was good. Now there was a benefit to this. What's going on? I described it earlier. This time of year, we have lots of hornets, lots of wasps. And by the way, hornets are wasps. Wasps are not hornets. So we have one hornet here in the state of Pennsylvania. That is Vespa Crabro, the European hornet. So that's the other thing. If you do any kind of open feeding, and by the way, it's a very inefficient way to feed. And if you haven't guessed, we are in the fluff zone too, by the way. So we're just shooting the breeze. That was the last question of the day. So I like to open feed because I like to test things out like this, but I also like to see what's around. Now, here's the thing. The little holes that I poked here, I thought it would be very easy for wasps and honeybees because the honeybees pile up on these holes and they're sticking their tongues through. This definitely favors the honeybee as far as its ability to get the resources in these Ziploc baggies. Uh, the wasps, the bald-faced hornets were there. The yellow jackets are there. Several different yellow jacket, by the way. And then uh, the European hornet didn't even waste its time. Couldn't do anything. And I was thinking when a European hornet lands on this thing with those flesh-cutting mandibles they have, it could cut a hole in the side of this bag, but they didn't. None of them did. Even the honeybees did not widen these holes. So this was really interesting to me because what did that just do for me? I can now feed a lightweight sugar syrup and I'm going to explain why I use lightweight and not two to one this time of year. Remember, open feeding is kind of for show, you know, on this scale. If I'm doing, because there are people, let's face it, that put out 55 gallon drums of sucrose for their bees and they throw a bunch of hay and stuff in it. That is not me. I am not doing that. Never say never, but that is something I would not do. Here's the thing. We're back at beekeepers now. So what am I doing? Why am I open feeding? Because I want these scouts to be over here on these Ziploc baggies of sugar syrup and not trying to rob each other out in the apiary, which is the next thing they try to do if they're not otherwise occupied. So I can do a couple of things. I can put sugar syrup in here and feed only the honeybees. Now, let's take it a step further. We know the wasps can't get those resources, honeybees do. So I just occupied the honeybees, good job. Now here's the other thing, but I've got neighbors that have bees that are a mile away or whatever. So here's the thing. This is why I'm feeding the light syrup. Go lighter than one to one. And here's why. I'm, remember, I'm not trying to get a colony of bees to gain weight. This is not because, you know, the ones that are out foraging, that are doing this, that are visiting feeding stations and stuff, these are the colonies that actually need it the least. They have the biggest workforce out there doing what they need to do. So the colonies that really need food and resources because they're so behind, they're so lightweight and all this other stuff, they need two to one, but feed that inside the hive on top of your insulated inner cover in your feeder shim. Give it to them direct and uh, that will help them out because they can't put the same number of bees out to forage. So now we're dealing just with foragers. And remember last year I stopped open feeding because I was dusting the bees with powdered sugar at the open feed station to see where they're headed. Where are they going? I'm feeding my neighbor's bees. They were heading out northeast of me. So I actually know who that is. Okay. I don't want to feed those bees. So if I lean it out, I have a lower sugar reward to water ratio. Eventually the only bees that are going to go to it are the ones that are economically minded and are nearby. So then I will only be feeding the bees that are in my apiary. Now when I'm doing that, these bees, that light syrup that we're putting out there, you think they're zipping back there and taking it in the hive and storing it? No, it actually gets 
pass around through trophallaxis, that's mouth-to-mouth -mouth passing of food and resources. So they're passing that carbohydrate to one another and it's used as ready energy. It's like handing out mints, you know, to your friends. So we occupied the foragers that could turn robbers in a time when the resources are dwindling in the environment. And we didn't feed the neighbor's bees because also they might not even want you to be feeding them sugar syrup. Think of it that way too. It's another reason not to open feed really. Uh, Cause there's some people that just don't want to feed open sugar syrup. So they don't want their bees in it now. So if that's under your control, then thin it down just for your bees. So, but the one gallon Ziploc baggies work. They held up great. And the holes stay the same size and everything else. And you can use them again. So, fill them up, put them on a tray in the sink, blah, blah, because they'll leak a little bit at the beginning. Now the holes are all there. And uh, while you're filling it, they leak out. But then when you flip it on its side, instead of, I use trays, cafeteria style trays to carry these. And uh, they stop leaking. So, here's the other cool thing about it while we're talking. Uh, with these full of sugar syrup, one of the problems we used to have with open feeding at a robbing station, we get a big rainstorm come through and all the rainwater comes in and dilutes the reservoir that the bees are feeding out of. Guess what happens with these bags? No dilution because the rainwater just runs off of the bag that's still full of syrup and it doesn't force its way in through these tiny holes and dilute your sugar syrup. That's another winner. The other thing is a raccoon came through and didn't even care about them. A raccoon could have tore these up. A possum came through, it didn't care about them either. And uh, that's it. Easy peasy for that stuff. So let's see, Hive Alive. A lot of people have written because the Easy Feed, that syrup that Hive Alive came out with was out of stock. It's back in stock, so that's good news. And that takes the place of your heavy sugar syrup, plus it includes a dose of the Hive Alive, which of course benefits the microbiome, the bee gut health, and all that other stuff. And if you want to know more about that, you can go to my website, thewaytobee.org, and there's a page that's titled Hive Alive Works. Why should you go to that page? Because it's also a discount link from Hive Alive. Uh, let's see. So the hives that are weak, feed them direct inside the hive, take care of them. Fondant packs, we're down in the 30s, but we're not at freezing yet. So hold off on your fondant packs until we hit freezing temps at night. Those are in reserve because those are emergency resources. Uh, let's see. Demand for sea salt right now is high. So if you haven't seen that and seen the observations and backyard studies that I've done on that, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is Frederick Dunn, just type sea salt in the uh, search bar at the top, and you'll see the comparison. Because for years, people were telling me to talk about uh, Himalayan salts, which by the way, is not sea salt. Those are just salts and minerals that people use on their salads and stuff like that. And then there's Morton sea salt, and then there's Celtic sea salt. So I tested them all for you. And guess what? The bees had a preference for the least expensive one, which happened to be Morton sea salt. So if you can get Morton sea salt and mix it into quart jars that you feed with outside, this is open feeding now, you're not putting this in your hive. Uh, two teaspoons per quart Morton sea salt, mix it up. The bees have a demand for it this time of year. Some people have made comments like that bees use that to cure honey and all this other stuff. I could find, I've talked to chemists, I could find no one who could explain why or if bees are using salts and minerals as some method of helping to dry down their honey. So I, if, if you have evidence of that, I would love to see a link and so that I could read the science behind it because right now I can find no other explanation except that the bees need salts and minerals. And so if we're offering that in addition to your fresh water that has nothing in it. Uh, so we're having these little salt containers out and the bees are on that more than they are the fresh water right now. So, and that's seasonal, so this changes. And the other thing is, just for people that wanna know, um, I am working on my moss wall and I think uh, Ross Millard also said he's doing some kind of moss thing and that's because I've made my own concrete drinker area for the bees. I'm using a fog nozzle, which is something you put on the end of the hose that 
puts water out in such a mist form that's like vapor just floating in the air. And this dampens your moss every day. And I have cinder blocks, concrete pad that I made, and I find rocks in my woods. So I'm trying to be aware of the fact that some of these mosses are growing in shade. So I want partial sun and shade areas. So the transitional areas, if I find rocks with moss on them, I collect those rocks, I bring them back, I put them in my watering station. Because it's clear also that bees prefer mossy areas for collecting their drinking water. So I thought, huh, moss shows up on the roof of your house for Pete's sake. So when you can see north sides of people's houses uh, just covered in ugly moss, sometimes mildew and moss in areas like that. But so I'm growing moss around my water wall and it's gonna make it look way better than it does right now because right now it's just a bunch of cinder blocks and rocks and bricks and stuff like that. But if they get covered in moss, this is just a fun project going into winter so we can break it up. I'm kind of mad at the chickens because they go through the bee yard every day, several times a day, and they pull away at all my moss. So I'm growing that. That's just a general information thing for the bees to have a moss drinking station. I want to thank you for watching me today and joining me for today's questions and answers. Please go to thewaytobee.org, click on the page, mark the way to be and submit your own topic if you'd like to have it addressed on one of these Fridays. So thanks for being here. Hope you have a fantastic weekend ahead.